This week, the Paul Security Weekly host discuss XZ, backdoors, and the fragile supply chain. Then in the security news, PFSense switches to Linux. April Fools? Flipper Panic in Oz, Tales from the Crypt with a K, Funding to Secure the Internet, Abusing SSH on Windows, Blinding EDR, More Hotel Hacking, Quantum Bleed, and more. And all that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Identity is at the core of every great digital experience. Ping Identity solutions support the scale, flexibility, and resiliency required by enterprise-level IT teams for lasting digital transformation. With 99.99% uptime and over 3 billion identities under management, they're the only identity vendor that's proven to champion the scale, performance, and security of large enterprises. That's why Ping Identity champions your unique identity needs. They give you the tools to offer your users the right access at the right times, no matter how they connect with you. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Are you ready to go beyond pen test reporting? Elevate your offensive security and measure risk reduction by streamlining pen test planning, report creation, and findings delivery. Request and attend a one-on-one personalized demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack and PlexTrack will send you a Starbucks $10 euro or pounds gift card totally free just for your time. That's securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. Coming to you from Purgatory Studios in semi-high definition, compliments of Darth Vader himself, this is Paul's Security Weekly, episode number 823, being recorded on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. I'm joined to my left by Mr. Larry Pesce. Did you forget something? No. What did I forget? But first, let me introduce you to oh. a man. That's not in my teleprompter. That sounds like a problem. <laughs> it's all right. You want to do it no, again? Oh, no, we're, okay. just, we're rolling with it. You we're, just rolling. Oh, we're rolling. We're rolling. We're rolling. But he just but introduced first. me. So now I'm going to introduce Paul, uh, a man who looks like Spider-Man pointing fingers at everybody else saying, no, you're... Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're never mind. You're never mind. Never mind. Uh, so yeah, in, uh, in Purgatory Studios again? Well... It's now Purgatory Studios. You asked week it was FUNet Studios. That's right. We're just going to keep... We're just, just change gonna, the name We're just going to, you know, it's... Anyway. It's Mr. Fun. Sam Bowne is here with us. Sam, welcome. Or not. Sam is frozen. I can't tell if he's just sitting really still or if he's frozen. That would be Sam, let's be honest. There he oh, is. Oh, no. Yeah. Am, am I back on? <laughs> now, we, now we can't... There's a hey, network problem here. Hey, he's here. What's up, Sam? No worries. <laughs> I'm... I I always blame the network. Well, it is the network in my case, but it's also my fault. Anyway, uh, glad to be with you. I mean, when I don't blame the network, when I don't blame the network, I'm blaming Bill Swearingen because usually Bill had something to do with it. What's up, Bill? He's here with us. Hey, what's up, guys? Sam, I had nothing to do with it, buddy. Like you and I were a team. The rest of the guys we can attack. (laughs) Hey, everybody. That's it. (laughs) Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. Hey, pleasure to be here as always. I think this is my third podcast for the week. So, it's your second uh, one with me just today. Yeah, just today. Which is so amazing. We're on, uh, is it beneath or below the surface? Below the surface. Below the surface. I can never remember. So below yeah. the surface. And Josh uh, has an intern or something. Well, she, she, she's, she's a really useful intern as long as you want things destroyed. We call her agent of chaos. Oh, mm-hmm. good. I've got, some hard, I've got some hard drives to be destroyed. So yeah. She's capable. I swear to God. <laughs> I, I believe it. I just I picked believe her it up too. at the daycare, and this child had stolen the teacher's tablet and had hit, hit the home button and was working on, on getting in. So, oh, gosh. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference 2024 full conference pass. RSA Conference will take place May 6th through the 9th in San Francisco and on demand. To register using the discount code, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC24. Use the code 54 US Sec Weekly. Hope to see you there. In this segment, uh, we are going to be discussing XZ backdoors and the oh so fragile supply chain. 
And there is, uh, you know, if you've been living under a rock, you may have heard, or may if you're under a rock, you haven't heard um, that there was a backdoor in the uh, famous, not so famous. There's a lot of compression algorithms. This is an implementation on one of them. Uh, LibZMA, <clears throat> LZMA, I should say, is the actual you know, in compression algorithm, which is usually a moniker for the compression algorithms that are used underneath it to make matters more confusing. Uh, we could do a whole, I think we've talked about compression algorithms before and it's, it's a rabbit hole. But in this particular one, I don't want to say it's a vulnerability, even though we got a CVE, which is probably a good thing, but technically it's not a vulnerability. It's a backdoor, but it did, it did get a CVE. Could you think of, could you classify that as an, intentional vulnerability as a backdoor yes i I'm like gr- i'm grasping at straws here really. what happened to bill bill just dropped bill ended up with a work emergency <laughs> after all that yeah, after all that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you ironically we were talking about that right before the show right yeah <sighs> it's all right um so i liken this to just a great point larry it's a great uh, segue into what i think is a brilliant point I might say so myself, is that I liken this to the Galen Urso bug that he put in the Death Star to make the thermal exhaust port vulnerable by design. Yeah. I think this is that bug. Like, I've been searching my whole life for, yeah, uh, like, instances, instances, I should say, instantiations of that scenario in the world we live in today, not just in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> and to me... This is it. I was like, what is the guy's name that, uh, the developer's name? Uh, no, I, I for have it for in front this of me. Bug? GAT75. No, the, um, I have all the links. Yeah. If you check the show notes for this episode, we were just talking about that. Um, there's like every resource that I could find. Uh, Lasse Colin? I don't know how you pronounce that. Yeah. Well, that's the original <clears throat> developer. I mean, the, the spy person guy. Oh, uh, um, let's see. Jai J- uh, Tan? Jia Tan? Jia Tan, yeah. Jia Tan. I thought that maybe it was Chinese for Galen or so. That's what I was kind of hoping. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I saw this I saw this great. It's not. It means something like, uh, I forget which is which. Uh, Jai and Tan means like home explorer. Interesting. Is what it, like loose translation means. I don't know if that's indicative of a conspiracy theory, which is my other brilliant insights into the story is i i translated uh jia tan from loosely chinese uh to english and i came up with home explorer or explorer of homes or something of the like yep and and in one of the articles that that i was coming across um that um they go and do a whole bunch of investigation about the the there's a lot to unpack here about oh, the, yeah. the folks that created the the back door and so forth um that uh Gia Tan uh and then at another point there's uh the name is used of a Gia Chong Tan um which when they go do the etymology of all the names and so forth that the overall feel is that someone just mashed together a bunch of Chinese sounding syllables mm-hmm. to make up these names um, because um, they uh, like Cantonese really rarely uses a J and especially not J I uh, the tan last Can- name. Cantonese is, is po- very different from is, Mandarin. Though. Right. Is possibly Mandarin, but is more common in specific Chinese dialects. Mm hmm. And there were some other ones that were like, uh, Chung isn't Mandarin, it's Cantonese. Mm-hmm. So like there's lots of unusual stuff about the names. And I'm not saying this was Chinese threat actors. Oh, like just because uh, the name is, I mean, we've, we've read articles about that, right? Like right. This, this is just, and what, what you're saying is, and I think even from what I was researching, um, you know, Home Explorer doesn't really make sense necessarily right right those lights are definitely flickering yeah um it but it's just made up stuff yeah basically and you know you combine that with some of the other analysis that they did here 
um, <clears throat> that based on some of the times that they saw Giatan doing commits, um, their quote office hours were in like UTC plus two or three roughly, which doesn't uh, jive with China's time zone when they might be working. Uh, also, they worked through uh, the Lunar New Year and mm-hmm. did not work on some notable Eastern European holidays, including Christmas and New Year's. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the interesting thing about this, though, is that this could happen to any project. Yep. I mean, conceivably, any company could have this hit this issue. And like on the surface, we're not going to know the threat actor in their uh, overall scheme or plot, right? Well, I mean, I'd go further than that. I mean, this probably already has happened many times. I mean, it was only a miracle we caught this one. You're you're absolutely right. And it's it's frightening to think about it that way, that there could be code commits laying in there that have gone into software that we could have on our laptops right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Now... Except Larry's got a Mac and Mac, so we get viruses. Right, so there's right. that. But they they might get backdoors though. They might get backdoors. It's <clears throat> right. true. The commercial didn't say anything about backdoors. backdoors. Yep. Now, and backdoors, they, Mr. Potato Head. Backdoors are not secrets. No. I mean, so so the, there are a couple well, a couple of things that that come to to mind with this. Like you know, Sam's like we may have this in any of our stuff, and it was kind of a miracle that it got found because there was like a half a second delay. And I saw yeah. some great memes uh, from Mark Rogers on this one. Uh, was along the lines of, if you want to put a backdoor in some corporate software, um, you go and ask the company to get added to their Git repo, and then you make the Git commit, and then they they merge it. But with an open source project, you do the long haul, and you be you you build a five year trust relationship with this developer of this, you know, super small project. Um, and then you uh, get your commit backdoor and almost immediately it's uh, noted by someone who's doing some timing tests and notices a half a second delay because of the backdoor you introduced. Right. <laughs> like, insanity. But I think, um, who was the Microsoft person that uh, found it? Yes. What was his name? I yeah. have a meme about that Sam, Sam looks like he's got something to say here. Yeah, go ahead, yeah just, you know, this is... Um, what we've been talking about all along, when we said uh, supply chain attacks, you're using this software. It's written by some guy under a fake name in Finland. You don't even know who it is. And I didn't think that could be a hostile nation state actor. I just thought maybe they're incompetent. But uh, this points out, you know, we're trusting, <laughs> we're trusting God knows who, random peop- number of random people with fake names in foreign countries when we install software. This is kind of crazy. Okay, yeah. let's let's... Let's talk about that for a second. That's actually very important, Sam. Your point is that we are extending trust yeah. to people that we don't know personally, that we don't have second and third connections to. It's not like, I, hey, Paul, do you know this guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, I went to college with him. I worked at company XYZ with him or whatever. They're just, they've been working on this open source project for five years. They must be awesome. But you don't even know it's the same person for five years. They're under a fake a name. Yeah, it could be, right. could be, could be. So, but but your point is that we are extending trust and we yeah. shouldn't be. And that's a fascinating point. And I mean, well, in the open source I think, universe. I wouldn't go so far as to say we shouldn't. It's a risk calculation. I mean, we're doing it in order to get desirable functionality and we're accepting a certain amount of risk to do that. But it appears that we may have underestimated that risk. Okay, okay. Uh, that, well said, beautifully well said. What is the risk of open source software? Right. And I would argue that it's the exact same risk as closed source software. Because yes, SolarWinds had the same thing happen a few years ago. So yes, I think that's a fair statement. And and how many developing team development teams are based out of India, Ukraine, China, wherever? And you don't know that. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing I would like to know is what kind of security scan could you run that will detect things like this? Is there anything you can buy that would do it? Yes. I don't think so. Absolutely. It's called a lie detector test and a $5 pipe wrench. But anyway. <laughs> um, but it doesn't scale, Josh. Yeah. I can try, damn it. I can try. Uh, no, in, in, all, in all honesty, you're right. It doesn't scale. So, so you know, magic parameters, back doors, logic bombs, the, we, we all know the terms, right? They're, they're all supply chain security. At the end of the day, it all comes down to supply chain security. What, what crap am I getting from my suppliers? 
that is going to blow up in my face, metaphorically or, God forbid, literally, and uh, cause me an issue. So, so, I mean, it begs the question, how do we know this isn't happening to us right now? And I don't have a good answer. Do you? Mm. Nope. I think the answer is we don't. Well, it's okay. easy. I mean, is, is the software you have behaving in, in an unexpected way? By, by, half a, <laughs> by half a second. <laughs> Everything is always behaving in unexpected ways. And, that, Let me and, ask and, a question. and therein lies and therein lies my point of detecting the the supply chain style attacks, especially, is my brain frequently wrestles with the how do I discover that the software that I have has been tampered with in some way because it's behaving in some way that it shouldn't, right? And how defining those parameters to then have a detection that can go across multiple systems and organizations and platforms and different types of software Good is luck. ridiculously hard. And, 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 and even if you wanted to monitor network traffic for network anomalies, how many companies of any size are doing that appropriately and properly and investigating anomalies appropriately and properly? I mean, if we only had somebody that did incident response, like like Bill or somebody, but that's impossible to get them on the show, uh, you know, reliably. Well, no, we, we so. had Bill on the show, but then we lost Bill. So it's yeah, impossible to keep them on the show. See, see, see. But uh, no, in all seriousness, how many, what percentage of companies, I'm honestly curious, do you think does network monitoring, traffic monitoring, egress monitoring type of stuff properly, at least in the U.S.? Properly? Well, define define properly. Yeah, you have to define properly, and then when yes. I take then then when I take my definition of properly, there is probably zero. Well, I think there are just levels of security maturity, right? They they do it at all that some level, and if they really do it well, that's a higher level, and everybody is gradually moving through the levels. I I couldn't say it like like that's beautiful, and and CMMI would like to pay your your commission now, and. Uh, <laughs> I'd argue that properly, though, Josh, um, imply because you can go by on the like a, a, a level of properly, right? Yeah, all depends on know, what your definition of is. I don't is. know if Extra Hop is still a sponsor or not, but I like Extra Hop as a network monitoring product they have for good sure. Stuff. Right, they have good stuff. We can agree yeah. on that. But it, in, and this isn't a knock on Extra Hop because you could have the best tool on the planet, the worst tool on the planet, or anywhere in between. If you don't integrate it operationally and act upon the things that that thing is finding, then it's, it's kind of, it's kind of useless. So properly no, 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 is, dude, is right. Part of that, a, a huge part of that, right. A huge part of that is looking at the results and acting upon them and acting and acting upon them. Oh my God. What an idea. <laughs> Getting results from your firewall, from your, from your network monitoring, from your whatever, from your help desk, for God's sakes, there was a half a second delay. If you got a, a ticket that said there was a half a second delay on login, you'd be like, and you'll excuse me, but who the fuck cares? Get the f no, I better but things I think, to work on. I think Andre, uh, fr fr friend, fr friend, friend, hey, friend, 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 uh, he has a Mastodon thread. Out, he is the person that discovered it. Okay. Um, now I can't find his thread. I thought I linked to it directly, but I didn't. Um, is it the we talked about how we found it. Because I want to say he was doing some kind of performance testing. He you know? was. Yeah, okay. He was. So he was specifically looking for deviations that uh, would imbe that are, are variables or control uh, paths in his performance testing. So we're just lucky that he was doing that. <laughs> Yeah. And then spent the time to investigate. Talking about acting upon it, Josh, right? Then spent the time to go, well, why is that happening? Not just, oh, uh, maybe I get too many, too many browser tabs open or something like that, right? Dude, any of us here would be like, yeah, whatever. Like, how many times have you waited a long, um, you know, a but long I think time this was for part, just to run? This was part of his testing that he was doing. Yeah. I can't now. I can't find the specific uh, post. Micro sorry. benchmarking at the time needed to quiesce the system to reduce noise. No, so he was specifically looking in this area. This this was what he was doing. And good lord, how lucky are we that it happened to come across the desk of the person who is 
paying really, really close close attention. attention to this. You know, the guy who first found Pluto did the wrong calculation predicting where it was, and it just turned out there were a whole lot of objects out there that he could have found and thought was Pluto. You know, mm. I think the most likely explanation that this bizarre test found one is that there are a lot more out there. Yeah, yeah you're not wrong. Yeah. Dear Lord God Almighty, you're you keep bringing that up, right? Sam. I don't, I don't like to think about that. I like to think my well, software is safe and trustworthy and doesn't have any thermal exhaust port vulnerabilities. Well, it occurs to me that the same old advice that we've always had is right, that you just have to have defense in depth. You have to believe that none of your, you have to believe that this is happening just like there's malware somewhere in one of your machines and you have to have uh, air gaps and other network segmentation and other controls that will compensate for the failure of this one. So what was that? What was the saying that we used to use? It's not a matter of if you're going to get compromised, it's a matter of when. Right. Maybe now it's no longer a matter of if you're going to get compromised and no longer a matter of when you're compromised. It's a matter of you're already compromised and you just don't know it. And it's a matter of how bad is it? What is it? What What are the consequences and the ramifications? Yeah. Just ask Bill. Oh, wait, we can't. Yeah. And how well can <laughs> you respond to reasons. it? Right. I mean, this has, been the, this has been the uh, doctrine since 2010, which is why we have to have network monitoring and instant response because we know that none of our controls are really stopping all the bad stuff. Okay. Right. So- Wait, wait, wait. This, this, this is interesting. So assume breach is right. now not just a, oh, to be prepared, assume breach. No, no, you're breached. Yeah, zero trust. Right. Well, zero trust is the way to, to, to try to reduce the detonation radius. Absolutely. Yeah. The boundary. But what can we do with the assumption that we are breached and the knowledge that we are breached? But I'd say it's the same as solar winds, right? Your trusted commercial products, intact, signed, could also be compromised. Agreed. And you just have to understand I'm, that's a risk. I'm not bitching about open source. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm a big I mean, fan of open in source. a way, we've known for a while that you can't really trust any of your stuff 100%, so you have to have other layers of defenses. Yep. Okay, also, so. But also, this is nowhere as bad as solar winds. Because uh, we caught it early. Uh, and, and, it, it was just in Debian unstable. For right, a, this one a, didn't get uh, there. relatively short period it, it, of time. It, it was a little bit more than Debian unstable, but well, because uh, other so Fedora, other distros picked, yeah, other distros did pick it up. and there were so there and uh, it, Ubuntu. It, it, infected, it but, infected Kali Linux for two days, which is right. kind of humorous. Right, it did. It did get Arch Linux, but the Arch Linux SSH is not linked to the LDMA library. They don't default. use System D. Uh, I. Not by default. Okay. Correct. Yeah, we don't care. It's Arch and Manjaro users, man. We don't care about System D. <laughs> I know the person that writes System D is very, very vocal about System D, but you know, I mean, well, System D after all. Well, and then System D, right? <clears throat> so there's that different, different segment altogether. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we started to get on some of the the detection and like how do we do some of this and like clearly the answer is for and I'm and I'm being snarky here a little bit clearly the answer for any open source software that you use um, and in the current version you should be going back and looking at all the previous commit messages to see what has changed over time to see if you can detect the presence of backdoors or unusual things. Because clearly the, the dead giveaway for something like this for me was one of the pieces that they picked up was that, uh, was it uh, uh, Giatan uh, started, uh, was granted um, uh, published access for releases um, by apparently Lassie Collin, who was the the maintainer since 2009. Um, And at one point during one of the pushes, um, the contact information within the package was actually changed um, from uh, Lassie Collin to Giatan. So if there were problems reported and that, hey, this thing, this commit looks shady, they were reporting it to the person that did the commit of the shadiness and they could just make it disappear. Is that common in open source projects? My understanding is most of them are run really by just one person. Yeah. I I mean, it was run by one person. They added another person for support because there were folks in the community that complained that there was only one person supporting it. Yeah. And 
in some of the cases, uh, the pushes for uh, some of the distros to adopt the uh, the the new updates uh, and some of the complainers, from what I remember, uh, were that were complaining that XE was only supported by one person, that you need more people to help maintain it, were people that only complained that one time and never appeared anywhere else out on the internet and had that, quote, bot army of folks to complain that you need more maintainers, you should pick this guy. And by the way, distros, you need to pick up these patches. The problem is de- detecting it early enough. I right. mean, in this case, we just got lucky. Yeah. So again, I don't need to panic on this specific instance. However, this tactic, as we analyzed everything, all the changes that were made, right? It was in the the building of the tarball. And so the, the Git release source code is often different than the tarball that gets packaged up, that gets consumed by distributions. Which I didn't, no, I didn't, I didn't know that necessarily. Yeah. I think that's really hmm. that's interesting. So we've got Josh. It's interesting to think about the supply chain and open source and where we could potentially get some wins as we all pick up packages from each other. And how do we validate those packages? Of course, in this case, this is what makes this so scary: is this person was the official developer maintainer of this yeah. package, so. I mean, how many Every, everything, well, everything, should well, che- everything should, on the surface, everything should check out. So arguably it was the official maintainer, the second add on backup official maintainer of this project who was, uh, who Lassie Colin was pressured to add by GR Kumar and Dennis ends who never appear anywhere else on the internet. Aside from this discussion demanding that there be additional we maintainers. We call those sock accounts, like sock, sock puppet? Sock, puck, sock puppet accounts. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, Josh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I know that question was kind of directed at you. No, no. I, it's, I, like, like The problem is, is we've, we're back to trust and risk. You know, we're back to who do we trust? Why do we trust them? Uh, what risk are we engendering by trusting them? Can we come up with a process? I mean, this goes back to, oh my God. Do you remember, was it Thought? T-H-A-W-T-E, Web of Trust. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Do you remember, do you remember yeah. um, uh, uh, key signing parties? Yep. 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 I, like, like, this is what we're talking about. I don't trust somebody that I don't know. But I trust that people that Larry know are trustworthy. And if he vouches for them, I'm good with it. You know, and, and, and Larry knows people that, that I don't, and I know people that Larry doesn't. Yeah, yeah but, so, someone, I mean, but the, someone could become bad, or I'll go back to my example of, you know, the Russians drop off a duffel bag with a million dollars in your front doorstep and say, you need to put a back door in the open SSH. Go. Yeah. Or they just hack your account, so they're using right. somebody else's identity. <laughs> yep. Yep, this is true. Detecting the behavior in the software is the tricky part. Yeah, I, I wanna, how do you know, how do you know which behavior is good and which behavior is bad? Because and it, it could be what, totally fine. And, and it, at what point do you benchmark it? So how do you know? Yeah, and at, at what point do you go? Well, what libraries are is every binary on my system using, and should they be using those libraries in this manner? And what if one of those libraries is just suspect? I mean, this is this is a hard problem to solve. I'm not smart enough to solve this problem. As I've been reading about it, I'm like, well, I really, I don't, I don't nothing. <laughs> when I see people talking about the the innards of the the build process and the library linking and the crypto, uh, also that was involved in this, uh, it's pretty staggering. Uh, the the body of knowledge that's out there, it's it's amazing. I mean, you can go you can go read it. I think we've given you kind of a high level summary, albeit not very well, of what what happened. But basically, the tarball build process in the make script. It was the make script in the tarball. So I guess as a distro, you would consume the tarball and then you'd build it from the tarball, right? Sure. And in that build process, it was inserting an object file. I think there was an object file that was just inserting, among other things, but the build script was replaced in some weird way. Sam, I don't know if you have, if you recall the technical no. details better than I, but. No better than that. But I'm thinking about attribution. Um, it really seems like the Russians, right, or the ones that the ones that did solar winds. It seems like a very similar yeah. level of technical skill. And the level of technical skill was really high. And I like when I read through the descriptions, I was like, 
that's really smart. <laughs> like, I don't know yeah. that I would do it any different, but they also did some. And so, but eventually that library was picked up, linked to by OpenSSH, dynamically linked by OpenSSH. And um, by is, is that D. true? By, by system, system D. D. Oh, right. That's it was a problem. system D wrinkle. Yeah. So it wasn't even directly connected to OpenSSH. Right. It's extremely subtle, careful attack. Yeah, the level of research that went into this makes me think that it was more than one person behind it. Yeah, to be I honest, think it's to be honest with you, right? right? Like it, it would make sense to me that this was a team of people brainstorming, going, "What if we did this? What if we did this?" And it was like a whiteboard somewhere, right? Like, well, maybe we can't do that because of this, that, and the other thing to construct and execute this entire attack as I've read about it all week, I'm like, it would, you'd be hard pressed to come up with it on your own. Like I'd be super impressed if someone came up with this all a hundred percent on their own. Well, the years of preparation, it's, it's gotta be a military operation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Totally. <sighs> so, okay, but so we get into the crypto is... part too, because there was no, you can't just look for a specific key. Cause it, there's, very differences in the it, it's not just one key the way that they did it i don't pretend to understand that, exactly how they pulled that off but what i gathered from that was you can't just go look for this one specific handshake for the for this key right it doesn't work there's like a that. way to there's a way to insert code inside the ssh certificate which will uh the open ssl certificate that will um the open ssh certificate which will then execute at the other end so it's not tied to a particular certificate that's crazy. The code injection vulnerability. That's yep. crazy. Is that a vulner? Is that a, a vul known vulnerability or feature? Well, there, so well, there are other ones like this, but the point is, you can add code to something that was not supposed to contain code, and then it executes as code at the other end. Wow. I mean, we really did title this one spot on how fragile open source in the supply chain is. These are very nuanced things. Yeah. But it, I guess it's no different than it's ever been. I mean, there, there's always a series of vulnerabilities coming. There's an enthusiastic community of researchers that find them and patch them. And uh, you have to determine your level of risk. I mean, if you're not guarding nuclear secrets, then probably just putting on the patches as they come out is good enough. If you're the military, you've got a whole other level of security you need. And I don't know what they do. They well, do certainly. Well, changes. there's a lot of things you can, better things you can do than most generic i don't want to use the term generic but like most linux distributions don't implement um the higher levels of security what is the uh kernel uh, uh g, g g what is it called the yeah, uh, secure linux extension i know the one se the one linux there's se linux se linux yeah and then there's another one too what is it called oh gosh what is it called now what is it the secure the guy, linux it was the guy that Twitch used to talk about. Atomicore uh, used to do that stuff. GR, GR, GRSec? Maybe. GRSec. GR, GR Security. Yeah. GR Security is the other one. Yeah, GR Security. Yeah, an extensive security enhancement to the Linux kernel that defends against a wide range of security threats. I wonder if they picked up on this. Yeah, I wonder if they would have stopped this. Mm-hmm. It's also a lot of work to run these <laughs> more secure <laughs> kernel extension kind of add-on things, right? Yep. I think in server environments, it's more feasible. On a desktop environment, it's a huge pain in the butt. Oh, to run your security one, or, or mm -hmm. SE Linux? Yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah. There was I mean, one that was, had no vulnerabilities forever, right? Was it OpenBSD or FreeBSD? It was OpenBSD. Yeah, and they uh, just did that by being super, super conservative about adding anything, right? They wouldn't yeah. touch anything until it really had a good reputation. So if you used something like that, you would have certainly not be affected by this. My friend Mark Donor would, would be hugging you right now because he's, he's the yeah. BSD zealot. Yeah. And he's like, you know, if it's not BSD, it's not good enough. If it's not BSD, it's crap. That's pretty <laughs> much what so. a zealot says, yes. <laughs> yep. You know, and then and then there's uh, Rick Friedman who does Pen2 on top of Gen2, you know, yep. and, and, and Gen2 is like, if you're not compiling it yourself, do you really know it's safe? And that's that's something I'm, that I'm, can be done. And, and, and arguably, if you compiled XE yourself, would it have been safe? Well, if you'd watched no, the compiler, no. probably not, because it, it it's it doesn't matter. It's it's obvious. Look, uh, do you know the obfuscated C uh, contest? 
Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is what we're talking. So anybody that doesn't know an obfuscated C contest is how crazy can you make your C code to make it do things that it shouldn't at first glance and, and just does. And it, there are people that have hidden entire like operating systems inside of C. It's crazy. Okay. And then there's uh, and then there's entire languages that way. For example, one of my favorites, brain fuck. Right. Oh God. Brain fuck is great. Larry, you know, you love coding in brain fuck, right? Yes. Yes, I do. One thing I saw from uh, Richard Hughes of the LVF LVFS project um, in the Linux software FW UpD was the every FW UpD client uploads or downloads, I forget which, an XML file. Like if you share your, your data uh, with, with the server or that's how it exchanges data, I forget exactly what it's used, but he was using XZ to compress that. Um, oh. And because it saves, like, uh, I forget he gave the numbers. Um, yeah, so uh, 1.6 megabyte download for end users. And uh, there, there's like a lot of users of it, basically. Um, and what he was saying was, given everything that's happened with um, XZ, the he switched it to ZSTD. <laughs> Now I'm just now I, that I read that I pronounced that out loud. I'm realizing that it sounds really bad. Yeah, they probably make a cream for that. <laughs> <sighs> but but, but <clears throat> so now Fly directly like, to the forehead. We're now replacing one problem with another. But What's, he said what? ZST metadata is also approximately three percent smaller than XZ. They make it and for some reason, too. Richard Richard trusts it more. I'm not sure why, because right. it's another open source project and it has 319 contributors. I rest my case, <laughs> right? Okay, so I wasn't alone in thinking that too. No. Because okay, I like Richard. I think he's really nice. He's yeah. really smart. But there's, there's a greater topic here. The greater topic, the larger topic is that open source software, closed source software, software in general, we trust. In software, yes. we trust. And we shouldn't. We should write all of our own software and never interact with any other software. And we'd go to business about 10 seconds later. Oh, this is my coffee analogy. Have you heard my coffee analogy? No, please, 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 please. This is my coffee analogy. So you can he, go. He's going to drink a cup and shit all over the place. No, you can go to the convenience store, Josh. <laughs> that, that's and the seagull management. Right. You go to the, the cooler where all the drinks are. You open up the cooler and you grab a pre-canned bottle of coffee. You pay for it to register it and you drink it like no questions asked. I got my coffee. You have no idea. I mean, you could read the label and get some uh, level of intelligence about the coffee, but conceivably you have no idea where the coffee was grown, where the beans came from, who packaged the beans, how the coffee what, was brewed, what water, was what bottled, water was used, was the kind of water, the whole thing. Right. Was so it, that's, uh, was it cow milk or was it goat milk or was it? Right. Yeah, that's I one end of the, the hold on, hold on, that's one end of the spectrum. The yeah. other end of the spectrum is I'm going to grow my own plants mm -hmm. to then harvest coffee beans. I'm going to roast those beans myself. And then I'm going to get, the simplest or the fanciest, depending on how you look at it, device to make my own coffee. And right? you're going to go, and you're going to get the water from your a natural own, your spring, own natural spring, and right. then do reverse osmosis purification to it, right? With machines that you built. And then I'm going to get a mass spectrometer, but also I'm going to get a mass spectrometer. I'm going to analyze all of the molecules inside of my coffee and measure exactly how much caffeine is in it and anything else, any other components. It could be in my coffee. And those machines, because I did research for a talk that I gave this analogy, are like, you know, tens of thousands of mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of dollars for that machine to analyze coffee. Because I'm like, can't I just buy a strip and it tells me how much caffeine is in there? Turns out like that's not so great. Like you actually need serious machinery to determine this. And then there's everything in between, Josh, right? There's the, agreed. you know, I buy my beans from a, the local coffee store that naturally sources them and I grind them myself and I put them in my nice coffee pot. Like with that's good with, enough with, for me. With tap water. Yep. Well, with filtered water. So I use filtered water from the refrigerator because I feel like it tastes better. And, and so that, and that's my coffee. It, my point is everyone's got their own coffee tolerances and it's the same thing when we talk about software. 
and got a better... you got to tune this for what is it the software that runs your manufacturing floor or is it you know maybe the software that it's hard to detect, it's hard to find software that doesn't really mean anything in an organization right mm-hmm. but there are levels right of impact and severity and risk and criticality and so the kind of scrutiny that it goes through and the kind of validation you do on your supply chain how much you take on yourself versus how much you trust in someone else should vary based on the criticality to your organization. And I'm going to give you a better analogy than coffee. If you're old, like all of us. like taking the wind out of my sails, Josh. Sorry. (laughs) If you're old, like all of us, you remember when Tylenol got cyanide put in it? Mm -hmm. Yep. So out of 14 gazillion bottles of cyanide in the world, of of Tylenol Tylenol. Tylenol. Tylenol in the world, cyanide. (laughs) Tyanide. Tyanide. I think it was called, they should have just changed the label to cyanide. It would have been fine. Uh, Out of, however many millions of bottles of Tylenol in the world because of one or five bottles or whatever that had cyanide put in them, they threw out millions of dollars of Tylenol worth of Tylenol. And uh, like the company crumbled in, in overnight practically. And that's what we're doing now, but we can't afford to do that because it's Mm. not one company. It's all companies. If we shut things down because of one poison pill, this is a good analogy because Oof. if one poison pill, we are screwed. Mm-hmm. We can't do it. We can't afford to do it. The GDP would crump, would crater. Everyone, well, everyone's you, GDP would crater. Everyone's yeah, this, GDP. Would this crater. is why you have to have risk analysis and you have to include other risks like competitor risks, the risk of lost business. You know, you just have to balance things. Cybersecurity is not everything. I want to go a different way. Okay. And this is something I was told. I don't know if it's true or not, but I was told that NASA makes things that break, but they don't not work. Hmm. Even when it's broken, it will still fulfill its function as best it can. And I think we need to design systems that even if somebody siphons all the information out of it, it will still do its job. I think we need to design systems from the BIOS on up. Well, CIA are, just, just uh, sent recommendations about three weeks ago of like that, where they said everything should be secure by default and so on. Secure uh, by design, right? Yeah. Yeah, secure by design. They had, they had a list of rules, more or less like what you're saying. A uh, better way to design products so you wouldn't have so many security disasters. And, and, and those rules are fascinating, well-intentioned, lovely, wonderful intentions, and really crappy in a lot of ways. But... Um, not that they're crappy, but they're they're very difficult to implement. But for the mission critical stuff, is that what we should be doing? Should we make it so that it will never not break? So it only has access to the information it needs and never has access to information it doesn't? So that no matter what somebody does to it, they're not going to get enough to, to put me out of business. Ah, there's this mysterious yeah. hand. There well, that, you know, that's defense in depth. We've had that. That's, you know, um, least look privilege how, and so look on. How, look how fancy we are now, though. Yeah. We have decanters. Oh, look at the but look at the look at the crud on the side of the <laughs> candle. Do you see that? Yeah, it looks like something got on it and dripped Good down Lord. in a creamy fashion. Like uh, that's better. We have decanters. Can- we have decanters now, though. Yeah, Goodwill had a sale, huh? They- Amazon. 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 Close decanters. enough. Oh, my staves uh, coming out. And and, and while, Paul, while you're pouring that and and so forth, you know, I I, I kind of want to jump back a little bit to the this thing about trust. And when, when we were talking about that whole trust, like we, we trust these things from these people and then, well, we've got to have this certain level of trust. And it something struck me about it and it was like, oh, but sometimes people can go bad. Well, you, you remember that guy, Edward Snowden? Yeah. Yeah. I he mean, this is that. that yeah, this is, yeah. Like, I, I and I seem to remember, and correct me if I forget which book it was that was like the seminal work about Edward Snowden, and and it got turned into a movie and all that type of stuff. Um, and the name is escaping me, and in fact, Edward Snowden's name escaped me for a little bit, so I had to, to figure it out while we were thinking about it here. Yeah, I know. It's just, but then it's the new studio. There's a lot of change. Yeah, yeah. The brain, brain, brain. It's yeah, impre- it, what, we're programming in brain fuck over here. Um, that <laughs> the the thing that struck me here was that as part of one of that stories was that Edward Snowden started going to like Linux users groups and, and security users groups and, and so forth. 
where at one point, one of these groups, and I could be completely conjecture here, but there was, if I remember correctly, there was an opportunity that there was a PGP key signing party. And Edward Snowden was there to get his PGP key signed. And Runa Sandvik was one of those people that signed his PGP key, if I recall correctly. Like someone in the industry that you respect very much, Runa Sandvik, signing the PGP key of someone who maybe doesn't have as much trust, Edward Snowden, who ended up being something yeah, that was really question. Someone was the really intent of that. The intent of that is not so much trust as a, a validation of identity. Right. Good point. Good point. Right. But I think many people also impl- use that as implied trust too. Yes. Well, if, because, well, because if you want, go ahead. If you, you want trust, that. if you want trust, that would be security clearance. And he had that. Trust is earned. Good point. Yeah. Valid. Yeah. Val- totally valid. And I remember after that happened, everybody was freaking out saying, how do we know there aren't more people in our organization that will leak out their secrets? And the problem is you don't know. I know I heard that the NSA was sending all their staff to like polygraphs every three months to try to find out if someone else was going to do it. Oof. I mean, there really is no technology. Yeah, it doesn't scale. Yeah. Hmm. So I think the only thing that does any good is, is defense in depth, the general principles, right? Can suppose that some of your employees are in fact incompetent or corrupt or betraying you, you have to have some plan to detect that and some plan to respond to that. Yep. So the Uh, other thing I thought was interesting about this is that um, in the process of creating this backdoor and implementing it, there were um, things in there that disabled the indirect function in GCC, which is a sandboxing uh, function. And so essentially this was disabled, uh, I believe during the, it might've been during the build process yeah. that this was disabled. So and, and, essentially and, there was and, kind of like a drop shields kind and, of component and, to it and as if well. I, and if I remember from my reading that I was doing last night, I spent a lot of time on this last night, that that quote drop shields for the disabling of the sandboxing was due to a very carefully placed period. Yes. This was the period. Yes. Like, wait, What? Yes. Yeah. It was one period. One period placed in one of either the commands or or what for the the compilation d- effectively disabled it. They and they it. also sabotaged a fuzzer that would have detected it. Yes. That's oh, why it's, but, they got to be a military operation with a lot of people working together. Here's yeah. you you sparked another one of my concerns about this this in this particular backdoor is in Thankfully, we caught it, right? But if it did get started getting into other tooling or operating systems, when we tear apart firmware from a reverse engineering perspective, pretty f- frequently, would you say, Larry, like not uncommon to come across a blob or file system within a firmware image mm-hmm. that is compressed with um, LZMA. Yep. Like, a- like early days when Larry and I were doing, you know, book research in 06, 07, it, LZMA was a thing that we had to deal with. Totally. And, and Binwalk had, still, to, still. had to be compiled with the, mod- the, yep. the whole and, thing. And, and like, so if you're like, your security researcher tools now have that hook in there, like, yeah, we've and, seen and, that before. And quite honestly, but. if you want all of the functionality of Binwalk today, you still have to go install LZMA on your own type of Correct. thing. Correct. Correct. So... And we we have seen threat actors go after security researchers, so that's certainly nothing new. But I want to call out, like in this case, the decompression algorithms are and tools are extremely valuable to reverse engineering uh, firmware tools like Binwalk, Unblob, and all of the libraries that they rely upon. For again, you often mm-hmm. find some type of compression of a blob or a file system within a firmware image. Because the firmware really wanted to, it's small, like back to Richard Hughes's point, like a lot of people are going to be downloading it. Also, you're going to compress a file system because you're limited on flash storage. So they're they're very common in embedded devices. Oh, you were going somewhere different before I went off on that tangent. I, Sam or someone. It's either way. So no, it's, I, it, I, I, they're all I, over but the I got, place. Wait, wait, okay. back up a step. Back up a step. You, you, you're telling me that the, 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 the microcode at the core of our systems is almost universally compressed using this backdoored 
or potentially a backdoored system. I don't, I don't want to say necessarily like UEFI or BIOS kind of firmware. I'm actually not sure which, if any, compression algorithms are in play or how you implement them. My coworkers could probably tell you off the top, top of their heads. But looking at other, in fact, I believe I was, the on firmware I unpacked the other day was LZMA uh, compressed. And I was like, wow, wouldn't that suck if saw the software I'm using had this bug and now it's back door. Hmm. Oh dear. So it's I more, mean, it's that's... more for like IOT kind of style devices. Uh, oh, cause those are, are totally these. not used in power and nuclear work and. Oh yeah. I mean, firmware, you know, is, firmware is firmware. The, like, the packaging like... and the de- delivery is, I mean, all pretty, you know, I wouldn't want to say standard, but there's a lot of common practices if you've got a small device, whether it's a camera, a phone, or whatever it is, it's going to use that kind of uh, some kind of compression somewhere. So, I mean, it was a really audacious attack to attack such an important software product that's used in so many other things. You would figure you're likely to get caught, and they did. Yeah, but I also, it's interesting how they just didn't go after SSH specifically, because right. that's almost too obvious. I mean, that if we had to design a way to, to backdoor a whole bunch of systems with, you know, some tainted code, like where, where do we get in? And it's, oh, it's in the libraries, right? It's in these, the, the shared, this is why we have shared libraries. If you're the maintainer of SSH or system D, do you want to go write your own compression algorithm? Nope. No. You want to use someone else's compression algorithm. Cause you know what? It's a lot of math. It's really hard to code. And being uh, computer scientists spend years, right, working on developing the next compression algorithm that can make something smaller and reduce the time it takes to compress it and also decompress it. And those are basically the factors of a compression algorithm. And it's it's fascinating to, to look at that. But that's something, again, you don't want to do on your own. You're going to rely on an external library for that. Pick and pick. Which which is the most valuable library? What's the most valuable library out there? From a G-Lipsy. malicious point of view, G Libsy. That's a good one. That's a good one, right? Mm. That's a good one. And that also depends on target. Assume you want to target security researchers. Mm. What's the most valuable library out there? Oh gosh, Network Stack Library, maybe. Lib PCAP. Um, yeah, like a Lib PCAP would be a good one to mm. target security researchers. Not that we're giving anyone ideas here, but, you know. Uh, oh. Brr, and you do, I, I think it depends on the level of security researchers and the types of tools they're using. Because, like, if you want to target someone that's doing, like, zero-day discovery, bug discovery, like, I'd think about targeting some of the libraries used by some of the reverse engineering tools like Ida Pro, Ghidra. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh. that's a good one. Uh-huh. Or you could just uh, backdoor NMAP. That would get everybody I know. <laughs> but better yet, yeah, backdoor a library that... <laughs> don't, you know, and feel backdoor feel the lib... Just lib don't. Lua, li- although I don't, you know, but also you got to look at, is it statically linked or dynamically linked? inside of nmap because nmap does have the lua uh mm. scripting language attached to it and i don't mm. remember off the top of my head and it wasn't i mean it was a couple of few years ago that i actually did compile nmap but that's interesting i did a whole i, I did a whole segment on that and i can't remember if i wasn't I paying that much it. attention to like the the library you know dependency kind of thing i was just like oh just give them the libraries that it that it needs burp um, suite oh the libraries it. that burp suite uses yeah, burp yeah. suite Burp Suite is Java. So is uh, Ghidra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So they're screwed anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, not wrong. Um, well, Linux know, think, libraries was it? Was there attempts against the the PAM uh, authentication uh, libraries and modules? I so want to say it wasn't. Were, there have been. Well, but, I mean, in this particular case of XD, yeah. there was not necessarily an attempt against PAM, but. Pam was tangentially related in here. Hold on here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Leonard Puttering mentioned that it may happen via Pam 
to libse Linux to libLZMA. Uh, but libse Linux does not link to libLZMA. Um, but an old downstream only patch in Fedora had a stale dependency on, in RPM spec, which uh, persisted long beyond its removable. Removal. Josh, I want to go back to your question because I think it's a good one, right? Exactly. Think about what libraries would be under attack that are widely used. And I think that one of the criteria there is something you really don't want to code yourself. And I think that compression, yeah. encryption, mm -hmm. sorting functions, you're going to rely on like a glibc or something like that because you're not, you don't want to write all those things yourself, right? It's those really super hard things that you want someone else to write, get it right. And that's what you're going to incorporate in your code. So you can provide that functionality. They're almost like this back end um, functionality that has to exist in order to allow your software to do conceivably like more interesting things from a user inter interaction perspective. Not to say that compression encryption isn't and sorting isn't interesting from a computer science standpoint. It's some of the most interesting areas in my opinion, but from a user functionality standpoint, we, we just wanted to be fast, right? And that could be the other reason why you're not going to write it yourself. Someone else spent years developing an algorithm and implementing it in open source code. How am I going to do any better and make it any, any better or any faster, certainly, than they can? So, yeah, I, I think arguably one of the roots to, to one of this problem, and, and I, I want to be very sensitive about what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm saying and how I say this, um, that we're dealing with XE as a project and um, LZMA utils managed by and largely developed by Lassie Colin, one person. We've encountered in a number of times over the last two years, a number of these projects that are maintained by very few people that have had some pretty scary vulnerabilities. And what was the, what was the last one? Uh, it wasn't curl. It was the one before that. Um, it wasn't NTP. Uh, no, someone maintains NTP. Yeah, very few people maintain it. I think it's like one or two people. Yeah, but there was another one that was main that we found that was maintained by one or two people. Um, Merslov Lichvar is a Czech developer. Yep, uh, that this, maintains NTP. Yeah, and I think is it's anybody, like the one person in the world who finds that was, super interesting and wants to maintain. Was it was it log for J that was maintained by like one or two people? And it was a part-time thing, and their two. It was two people. I remember their, it was two people. Yeah, yeah. Their quote Patreon that they got, like the coffee donations, like the I think the year that they it, that we found that there was the issues with Log for J, um, their Patreon, whichever the amount that they got paid for doing that maintenance was somewhere between three hundred and three thousand dollars for the year. And I want to say it was closer to the 300. Mm -hmm. Like how many of these projects out there like XE or LZMA Utils or Log4J or NTP are maintained out of the goodness of the heart of these people? And in this case of XE, um, uh, Mr. Colin uh, <coughs> self-professes to say that he often goes on, quote, internet breaks for his well-being and his mental sanity. So he literally steps away from this stuff for months at a time. Yep. Right. Uh, I do want to say that I believe NTP is 59-year-old technologist named Harlan Sten. This person who maintains NTP. Okay. So, I, I, so my, my question is, how big of a problem is this really? They, and, dub, and they dub him, sorry, they dub him Father Time. <laughs> It's very appropriate. <laughs> was it now? Was that the the main? Is that the maintainer or the creator of NTP? No, uh, this is the maintainer. Okay, because the creator yeah. of NTP, creator, someone different. Yeah, the creator of NTP recently passed away. Is that who passed away? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I've got a question. Has anybody actually surveyed all of the libraries used in large chunks of the internet and applications, and found out how many maintainers they all have? How many are vulnerable to a malicious takeover like this? Well, I think all of them are vulnerable to a malicious takeover in some capacity. Agreed. Agreed. In some capacity, but if you've only maybe got who's one or who's two who's who's more vulnerable to this right, type of right, takeover right. than, than other levels? Yeah, I agree. 
I agree. If, I, if, if you've got one or two maintainers, it's really easy to become a part of the inner core. Right. And it's well, easy to get code by that doesn't get checked on. I know that every weekend, Larry and, and, and Paul, uh, you know, maybe because they're Shomer Shabbos, they, they, they don't do anything on Friday and Saturday. So I, I commit something, you know, Friday night at sundown and it doesn't get looked at. And it's already out and rolled out to 500,000 websites by yep. Saturday night. I, I'd argue that this is what allowed some of this to happen through uh, uh, Mr. Collins, uh, proclaimed or, or his, uh, his internet breaks for some mental health where, uh, Gia Tan was able to do some maintenance. I thought he had health project. issues. I thought the XE maintainer person had health no, issues. I read that. The, somewhere, the, but... the, the arguable health issues were mental mm, okay. and, and that is what, and that's why I'm trying to be sort of sensitive about it. He takes sure, internet yeah. breaks for his well being, and we, we can leave it at that. Like what the reason is that is not important. He takes internet breaks for his well being. He disconnects and that's a good thing. But during his disconnect, someone else is taking over the project. And in this case, that particular person took person, over person. And, and maybe was less than trustworthy. And they don't, the, the maintainer, the person that is quote trusted, and I'm using air quotes here, trusted doesn't, uh, doesn't have the ability to go back and review the work because they are in fact disconnected from the mm -hmm. process. I mean, that might be a little bit more on the unusual side, but uh, I still think that one, um, you know, you know, one or two maintainers of projects that we rely on across so many projects is incredibly scary. This is not the first time. Well, and this is another reason why the the Linux kernel is kind of in. Uh, in oddity in this sense that they do pick up on stuff like this because there's a large team of folks working on it that yep. are aware that people may want to put something in the Linux kernel that is malicious. And they are very well-trained. The well-trained eye is looking for that type of thing. So much so that when, was it the University of Michigan? Someone did a, a research project and I believe was able to get code into the Linux kernel, but then they had to re uh, re re retract the paper because they didn't get permission. Oh, right. But I think right. they Those did the get code. They did but I don't think the code. Project. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think the code was necessarily that malicious, the code they managed to get through. There were some commits where someone on the Linux kernel team was like, Are you, are you nuts? No way. And I don't know if that was for a security reason or just because of a like bad coding practice reason or whatever, but they were like, no, I'm not accepting this, this commit or pull request. So hmm. I don't know. So I guess my point is, are there lessons to be learned from the Linux kernel team or does it just benefit from having more structure when more people maintaining the Linux kernel? But of course the, the kernel is even divided up into sub there's like the main kernel and then there's device drivers and device drivers are, yeah, but drivers but, are, but then, 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 not the wild west, but they're, they're, it's different. But arguably, do you need to have that kind of scale for something like XE? Maybe not scale, but maybe policies, procedures, and it, a, a field manual, something, some automation help. Yeah, which I mean, Git does provide a lot of. Yeah, but you gotta have, you gotta have someone to be implement that, and if you're yeah. just one, if you're just one person. Well, I think it's a great segue because I have a, a news article about about just that. Mm -hmm. So, so why don't we do that? We take a break. We yeah. exit out. Yep. Yes, I think we are. But man, th th this is blowing my brain in terms of the the trust and risk. Man, like I, I'm, I'm like, yeah. There, there's a. There, I mean, you know, we we we, com we, we compressed we, a lot of information into that segment. Yeah, and and, yeah. and arguably <laughs> we didn't. Wow. <laughs> We, took a, took a and, second and you know what? That one. And you know what? There's still a lot left to unpack here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we can uh, decompress and, and in the next segment. Joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned. We'll be right back uh, in a few moments with the security news. 